can you help me? <laughs> <laughs> All right, I think, is this working? Great, I think we're ready to get started. Um, my name is Julia Morton and I'm happy to Welcome you all to our community colloquium today. Um, I'm part of the Environmental Justice Club here at Bren. And today we are pleased to have Ms. Katie Rule from, um, she's the Senior Attorney Advisor for the Office of Environmental Justice at the US EPA. Take it away. Thank you. Well, thank you. <laughs> How do I turn this off? Do you do that? Okay, good. Well, thank you for inviting me, Julia. And it's such a, a pleasure to be here with you um, at the <laughs> Maybe I can talk louder. No. Does that work better? No, good. Um, because I, I had the opportunity to look at the, the, the Brin School of Environmental Science and Management on the web and became totally enthralled with the nature of this, this, this curriculum and, and the faculty and how you go about your business of addressing environmental problems. And then I had the, the joy of meeting this morning with the Environmental Justice Club and got even more excited about it. So I really do thank you for being here. Um, and what I'm going to try to do today is really take what you are doing here with the integrated approach of, of science, management, law, um, looking at nonprofit, looking at for-profit application, and kind of touch that and show the intersection of how what you're doing here is so vitally important, really for the future of our planet with the, the challenges that we have. Um, today, the, the theme of the talk is going to be mapping environmental justice, because we've got to think of environmental justice as a process that's not linear, but it really is three-dimensional with X, Y, and Z coordinates. And whenever I come to California from Washington, D.C., I always laugh because Was people from Washington think Washington is the center of the universe. People in California think California is the center of the universe. And from my perspective, I think California wins <laughs> because you have some of the most serious challenges facing society, and you have some of the best solutions for overcoming those challenges, but you always do it with a lot of creativity and intelligence and flair, so it's, it's a lot more fun as well as being, as well as being effective. And really what this, this slide here represents besides that, that, that clash of the titans is that you've got in Washington a high pressure system and in California have a low pressure system, but we all know that the low pressure system is what push, pushes the high pressure system out. And so when you think about the challenges facing our society, when you think about our storms literally and figuratively that relate to our economic situation, our, 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 uh, the racial tensions, the environmental challenges, the health challenges, um, they're enormous, and we really need the best and the brightest thinking outside the box and widening the lanes of your thinking, and I think that's what you get here at Bren. So what I'm going to try to do today is to um, basically uh, spend the time here um, with a pretty fast pace of starting with, with helping you understand some environmental justice techniques and challenges, which are really not the, the core practices and approaches, but really kind of getting you grounded on what environmental justice is and what it's becoming and where, it, where it's going so that you'll be able to apply it to whatever you're doing, wherever you're going to do your work when, when you get out of school. Um, and then I want to move into some of the core work of the authorities and the approaches because, again, that's where you get into more of the roadmap. And then I'd like to end up with a couple of examples that are based out of California but really represent work that, that's done across the country. So that's what I want to be doing over the next hour. Uh, so it's really important when you think about the concept of environmental justice, you start with what does it mean for you? What, is, what are some of the first words that come to your mind when you hear the words environmental justice? You know, is it too much pollution? Is it not access to resources? Is it limited to pollution? Does it also include economic justice? Does it include health justice? And it really is all about these things, but the most important thing is you develop your map for your practice of environmental problem solving what, what do you think about and where, where, is, where, where does it mean for you and where does it resonate for you? And as you can see from the, the multitude of words at the top, environmental justice really is about all of these things. And what I want to do now is when you think about the definition of environmental justice, realizing that, that EPA has a, a definition, which I'll be talking about in a minute, um, but it's really not limited to the word environmental justice. I learned fairly uh, quickly when I got to EPA after I'd spent 25 years suing the agency that other federal agencies don't call it environmental justice, but there were 
is equally impactful, such as HUD, the Housing and Urban Development, which is in providing housing, that you want to be safe, that you want to be affordable and accessible. And what we'll see over time in the last almost eight years of the Obama administration is the concept and the terms have changed. And what's important for you is not just to be able to understand the history, which you need to do, but you also have to navigate the present, but you want to apply all of that to kind of help shape and predict the future. And when we think of environmental justice, we think about the who, and we also think about the what. And as I'll be talking about um, over the course of the hour, it originally started with too much pollution in particular communities, but it really has evolved into so much more. It's evolved into, like I said, access to services and equitable development. So as you're thinking about what environmental justice means to you, to what you're studying now, and where you want to go, really think broadly. And really kind of expect that no matter what you're doing, there will be an environmental justice implication. So um, to, to ground the analysis, like I said, in the history, EPA in defined environmental justice as the fair treatment and meaningful involvement of all people, regardless of race, national income, and origin, and with respect to the development and implementation of environmental laws and regulations and policies. It's a very encompassing definition. Uh, when you think of fair treatment, that's really what we think about as procedural justice, and it's the notion that people absolutely have a right to influence the decisions that affect their lives, and they should be part of that decision making. And that decision making relates to all aspects of environmental protection, not just the development of the laws and the rules, but its implementation, how you go forward. And what's really exciting, I'll talk about it a little bit later, um, hot off the press is chapter 10 of the economic analysis, which is focusing on how do you address environmental justice compared to the population as a whole. As we talked about environmental justice being the, the primary term for a number of years, um, under the Obama administration, there was another evolution, another iteration, and that was the concept of overburdened populations. And again, it recognized that the uh, population of concern, the who's, would be minority, would be low income, and would also be tribal and indigenous populations. And it's also about the too much of the pollution, but it's also about not having uh, the capacity to withstand pollution, to prevent the pollution, but also move that barometer from an uh, 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 environmentally healthy community, but an economically vibrant community, a healthy community. And um, that's something that's been, I think, very powerful in helping EPA take the concept of environmental justice and really embed it with the entire federal family, and it's been very exciting. An example of the, the need to understand the different terms really has come about in the work that we've done following Hurricane Sandy. And um, I come from Florida where in one summer I lost my roof four times, and so hurricanes are always hitting us, but it wasn't until it hit New York, you know, and probably wiped out the economic center of the universe that I think people started taking this seriously. Um, and the original concept of then the, the, the president's strategy to deal with the disaster recovery and resiliency was to think of vulnerable populations. But as we know, the vulnerable populations that they were thinking about were the more wealthy white people who had homes on the coast who were being destroyed. And so we were able to really work within that, that decision-making process to say, it's not just that you're vulnerable, but that you are overburdened, that you have too much pollution, don't have access to services. And so once again, it's this notion of really understanding um, the, the breadth and the depth of what environmental justice is. And the example here, I think, is something that, that is very informative. Um, we also recognize within the concept of vulnerable and overburdened populations gets into issues such as medically underserved and all sorts of things. So it really is a broad concept. So, so that's really, like I said, it's grounding you in the concept of terms, thinking historically but moving forward. Um, but it's also very useful, useful to be able to think of the various factors that um, relate to environmental justice. And our office, the Office of Environmental Justice, back in 2010, uh, produced uh, a peer-reviewed supplement to the American Journal of Public Health on what we call disproportionate impact factors. And the reason why it's useful to understand the range of impact factors is when you, when you have a better understanding of the nuances of the problems, you have a much wider range of options and opportunities to address those problems and overcome those problems. And so we have seven of them, and I'll just kind of walk them through pretty quickly. Um, the first one, which is the more historic concept, like I said before, is proximity and exposure to pollution. In fact, environmental justice really kind of coalesced 
after the publication of a report called Toxic Waste and Race by the United Church of Christ, which was looking at the proximity of minority and low-income populations to hazardous waste disposal facilities. And so that's really important. And I had mentioned Chapter 10 of the Economic Analysis Guidelines, and it really is looking at proximity as a surrogate for exposure. So it's, it's important. It's where you start with, but you certainly don't end there. Um, a concept that um, really needs all of your brilliant work is the notion of, of cumulative impacts. And that's the realization that even though our regulations are generally based on controlling one contaminant at a time, people are exposed to multiple, multiple contaminants over multiple periods of time. They're dealing with chemical stressors, but they're also dealing with non-chemical stressors. And there's an urgent need to try to put all of this together so that you can have a better predictor of what do we need to do for the environmental problems, but also ultimately how do we deal with the health of the people uh, exposed to those, including the ecosystems, not just human health, but the ecosystem's health. As I uh, mentioned before with the realization of the severe impacts and the relationship of physical infrastructure, um, that's been recognized as an important environmental justice factor. And that can relate to infrastructure relating to drinking water systems as well as wastewater systems. It can be access to transportation center centers. Um, we have a, a major program within EPA on uh, uh, funding programs for, uh, for the facilities for drinking water supplies, but too often the, the, the communities that get the funding are the bigger communities and not the smaller communities. In, in Florida, when I was uh, practicing law, uh, we were working in Palm Beach County, which is one of the wealthiest counties, probably next to Santa Barbara County in the country. And as it turns out, that the communities on the coast were uh, having a water bill that was about a fourth the price of those people who lived around Lake Okeechobee. And the, not only were they paying more for their money, but their water literally looked like the color of urine, and it contained contaminants such as trihalomethanes, which were above the levels of causing birth defects. And so that's an example of where physical infrastructure is vitally important and really needs to be addressed. And I know a lot of you are dealing with water issues, water conservation and allocation, but be mindful of the physical infrastructure concept. Um, and the, the, the fourth of the disproportionate impact factors is susceptible populations. And a lot of times we think of children who have, um, from a physiological perspective, increased vulnerability to exposure to pollution and also lack of access to services. Um, but there are other, even, even now we're learning across the continuum of the life stages and even elderly populations may be susceptible, such as exposure to air pollution with asthma and things like that. Um, the next factor is um, unique exposure pathways, which uh, most often is considered with subsistence fishing, hunting, and gathering. And um, an example there is in the state of Alabama, uh, the, well, across the country, the national default level for consuming fish would be 17 grams per week. But if you look at the analysis, it's really closer to 100. And so there's an opportunity to make those fish consumption standards reflect the population that's being exposed to whatever is in the river that they're eating. And what's really exciting is that the state of Oregon and a couple of other states are really changing what that default standard is. But again, this is an example of an important intersection of the science and law and policy. Um, the, the, the sixth factor um, gets back to the meaningfully engagement definition of environmental justice, that it is about the ability to participate in the decisions. It's about making sure that when you have a public hearing on a permit for a facility, you don't have that public hearing in the afternoon downtown where people are having to work and can't get to it and other factors like that. Um, there's been a lot of work with executive orders, um, recognizing the need for English uh, translation, translate with, with low English proficiency. So that's an important factor um, that has to be considered when you're thinking about uh, addressing environmental justice and advancing environmental justice. And then the most recent uh, factor is psychological stress, because when you put all of these factors together, um, there has a has big impact on the, the, the community, the family, the individuals as a whole. And what's, what's interesting for the President's National Disaster Recovery Framework, which came about after Hurricane uh, uh, Sandy, uh, one of the nine factors is psychological stress, so it's growing in importance. And I know some of you are doing some work on behavioral changes, and so this is an, an, uh, an opportunity to be considering some of those factors. 
So um, again, building the base, the, the definitions of environmental justice, the broad ranges, thinking about the, 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 the factors. It's also important to understand what some of the current plans are and where they're going, again, because those do relate to uh, decisions that you'll have to be dealing with in your careers. There'll be job opportunities, so on and so forth. But um, back in 2010, EPA developed what we called our Plan EJ 2014. And it was the first time that we had a comprehensive plan that took environmental justice outside the Office of Environmental Justice and embedded it into every single activity of, of EPA. And again, I think this is the first indication of the four type of thinking that we're thinking about and we're seeing with respect to environmental justice. Um, the goals were important, they were broad. Again, it's about protecting the environment and the public health. All of our environmental statutes do look not just at the place, but the person in that intersection. Um, it's recognizing the importance of making sure the people who are, who are most overburdened and most suffering are, have, have the capacity to participate in those decision making. And what's very exciting, I think it gets to the, the cross-cutting uh, work that you're doing here at Bryn, is the notion of partnerships. You know, our challenges are too severe, they're too intense, they're too frequent to try to think that silos will work. And silo busting is a really important concept that you guys can own and try to, to get us past where we've been in the past. Um, what's also exciting that I particularly like about Plan EJ is it really looks at some of the core functions of what the agency does. And most of our core work is, and I'm going to go into a little bit of detail in other slides, but it's rulemaking, permitting, and compliance and enforcement, um, which are governed by our statutes and our regulations. But it's also recognizing that we're not going to solve the world's problems and create healthy, sustainable, knuckle communities by just looking at a, a regulatory command and control approach. It's the notion of let's, let's start with the communities and what their needs are. And even though we may stovepipe issues and programs, the community doesn't. Um, and it's also realizing, like I said before, that uh, even though EPA is the go-to agency for environmental justice, there's, there's 21 agencies out there now, and all of them have something to do with environmental justice. And again, as students, those, you can even be thinking of that as job opportunities. So when you're thinking about careers, definitely look besides EPA. But again, continuing with Plan EJ, uh, in addition to setting the bigger roadmap, we want to kind of provide the vehicles along the way. And we've created uh, a number of tools uh, I'll talk a little bit about those in more detail, but one of them is um, some legal tools. We have a, a tool which has identified all of the provisions in the environmental statutes which um, relate to environmental justice. Um, we have science tools. We have something coming out soon for, for public consumption, which we call EJ Screen. California is already a lot years ahead of us because you have it and you're doing it, but on a national basis, it's trying to look at the factors of race and income as it relates to various pollution, uh, pollution exposure scenarios to get a sense of where might resources need to go to a community. I mean, you know, whether that might be some activities in planning, maybe some, some capacity in grants, and possibly in some of the regulatory programs. Um, and then there's a lot of resources. What, EP, what EPA is trying to do, instead of having a bunch of grant programs coming out of a bunch of offices, is let's really try to have one common platform so that we can start measuring the progress and so that we really can make a visible difference in communities. And so, like I said, the, the, Plan, EJ, um, the Plan EJ concept is, is precedent setting and it really set the stage for where we're going from here. And that, that leads us to the notion that even though 2014 is gone, environmental justice is not. And we need to be thinking about not just 2014, 2015, 2016, we need to be realizing that we will, no matter what, have a new president you know, in a couple of years and we need to be thinking now how some of the work we're doing today can have an impact into, into the future administration. And it's important, again, as you're trying to be able to navigate information, trying to predict what agencies are doing now and going forward. Um, I did not realize this when I was suing the agencies for all those years, but EPA does have a strategic plan. And that strategic plan really is our contract with the public on what we're going to be doing. And embedded in that plan is the notion, again, of protecting human health and the environment, recognizing vulnerable populations and vulnerable communities. Um, our administrator has identified um, a number of, of priorities, and one of them is making a visible difference in communities. And what's important about that, and I think this is where we've got the framework, but it's going to be up to you to really help make this framework come alive, is the recognition that we want to be able to measure 
what's happening. We need to have help in developing the baseline circumstances so we can look at that change over time. Because you know, the adage is if you measure it, it'll get done. And I think that the, the agency and the, and the federal family wants to go in that direction, but this is a, no, a, a really important opportunity for you to start practicing what you're learning here at school. And some of our core values, I think, again, which I think is really very, very much consistent with what you're doing at Bren, and this is actually coming out of President Obama, is the importance of, of science, of sound science. We need to make sure our decisions are based on that evidence-based as opposed to consensus-based. Um, obviously, like we said before, it's the concept of transparency and engagement so that all parties can, can know what's happening in that decision-making process. And of course, as a lawyer, my favorite, the, the rule of law. You know, we need to understand um, what the laws are and how they apply and make sure they're applied fairly to all populations. The, the focus of, is the same. Again, it's the integration of environmental justice throughout the agency, dealing with the environment, dealing with uh, health, dealing with overburdened populations, Again, supporting communities so that they can be full partners in the process. So the work that we started with Plan EJ is still a very valid and viable roadmap on to 2020 and beyond. Um, so that, again, laying the groundwork, kind of gi giving you the, the, the information and tools that you need to be kind of integrating within your own thinking about what you're doing on your studies. So now I want to turn to the second part, uh, which is a little bit more basic. And it's really going to be a crash course in environmental justice law. But again, by what I'm going to go through, again, it's to give you the, the tools and the information so that you can start help shaping what's happening in, in the, the near to distant future. Um, as probably many of you know, or maybe you don't, uh, is the notion that there is no environmental justice law. Our authority is Executive Order uh, 12898, which was adopted by President Clinton in 1994. I, love the fact from one perspective that in 2014, President Obama um, issued 31 executive orders. So for a number of years, we were told, oh, you just have an executive order, you don't have a statute, what you're doing is not important. Well, we can definitely say that what we're doing with environmental justice is relevant when you think about the amount of work that's done through executive orders. But it's important to look through the provisions because they really are setting the, the, the four directional signals. First of all, it talks about environmental justice being relevant to all agencies, not just to EPA. It talks about making environmental justice core to your mission, not just a little sidebar office that can be a publicity shop or provide just simple grants, but really getting into rulemaking, permitting, enforcement. Um, the, 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 the main uh, approach for environmental justice are the words addressing disproportionately high and adverse human health or environmental effects. And again, this is an area that's just ripe for research, ripe for activity by graduate programs because we have the words, but what do they mean? How do you translate them into a quantifiable decision? And again, it's the notion that it's comprehensive because it's getting to the, pro the, the policies, the programs, and the activities. And again, it's recognizing that the focus of the who would be minority populations and low-income populations. And again, the recognition that tribal and indig indigenous populations are included within that focus. Now, what's interesting and most people don't focus on is the fact that the executive order was accompanied by a presidential memorandum, which is another vehicle for presidents to make decisions. And what's interesting about the presidential memorandum was the recognition that even though the executive order is not judicially enforceable, the, the presidential memorandum said it's through the existing environmental laws that give us the ability and the opportunity to address the concerns you have with EJ communities. Our federal environmental laws don't mention the word environmental justice, but they are fundamentally about helping the communities become safe and healthy and sustainable and resilient. And once again, in the President's Memorandum, they emphasize the focus that it's not just the general population, that you can have activities that benefit the general population as a whole, but there are, are subpopulations within that bigger community that are suffering and are more overburdened. So that, so the executive order and the president's memorandum are really our seminal authorities for doing environmental justice back from 1994. Um, I wanted to dive a little bit deep. Uh, this is why you should put your seatbelts on because we're going to cover a lot of statutes in a short amount of time. Uh, but, but again, it's really important to know that there is a, a robust ability and capacity to address overburdened communities through these statutes. You know, for example, under the Clean Air Act, um, there's the uh, work that's being done with greenhouse gas emissions from climate change. 
uh, there's work for prevention for significant deterioration of particular areas where there's actually some provisions to do environmental justice analyses that can be reviewed in court if they're not done properly. Um, under the Clean Water Act, I know a lot of you are working on water issues. It can, uh, the, the workhorse of the Clean Water Act is the National Pollution Elimination Discharge System, the point source discharge, um, which is fundamentally tied to the health of our, of our uh, marine water bodies as well as our, 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 our fresh water bodies. Um, there are a number of other provisions under the Clean Water Act dealing with planning uh, for areas and dealing with stormwater runoff, which has a serious impact. Um, there's some really positive programs now, one called the Urban Waters Program, even though it's not dealing with rural areas, but it's nevertheless trying to look at that intersection of water quality, but also the human interface. And from an environmental justice perspective, it relates to the ability of uh, environmental justice communities to be able to get to the water, actually, and, and be able to recreate and looking at the public health benefits of that. Uh, one of my favorite statutes is the Safe Drinking Water Act which um, on one part deals with drinking water systems, and that's where we get into um, that, that equity issue of, you know, are you operating in compliance with the water quality standards, and are there some exemptions, and so on and so forth. But I think the sleeper part of the Safe Drinking Water Act is the Underground Injection Control Program, which is a very serious statute, especially in California. Um, probably most of you have heard of the concept of the hydraulic fracture, and we talked about it earlier. Um, unfortunately, or for, well, I have to be unbiased, but uh, the, the notion is that underground injection um, was required to be regulated uh, under the Safe Drinking Water Act uh, for hydraulic fracturing, and that was the lawsuit that I had back in the 90s. Um, but there was an amendment which exempted hydraulic fracturing from being regulated under the underground injection control program, except for diesel. So that's, that's one area where it's not a robust practice, but I was reading in the paper just last night that there are some issues of oil and gas contamination wells in the state of California, um, which are indeed regulated by underground injection. So it's a really important statute to become familiar with. Uh, the National Environmental Policy Act is, is probably my favorite statute now, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that later on. Um, but the concept of the Resource Conser Conservation Recovery Act is a statute that deals with the management of hazardous waste from conceptually from the present on into the future. It sets that cradle-to-grave program for treatment, storage, and generators of hazardous waste. And it actually has one of the most powerful provisions for environmental justice in what we call the omnibus clause. And it gives the agencies the ability to take whatever additional measures are necessary to protect human health and the environment. And that gets into providing buffer zones between a facility and the surrounding neighborhood. It even gets into permit denial, but that's a very powerful uh, statute and opportunity under that, under that law. The Comprehensive Environmental Response Compensation and Liability Act, otherwise known as Superfund, is dealing with past contamination. And it's been around for a while and it's doing some really good work, um, but again, thinking of a practice opportunity um, that's on the, the cutting edge is, uh, historically it's looked at, well, how do we deal with this contamination? And that's then, when, we, when we've dealt with the contamination, whether we've, we've dug it up and moved it to another community or whether we've imposed an engineering or an institutional control, then, then EPA's job was done. But what we, from the environmental justice perspective, have been able to do is to show them that what you do on that site is related to how much you clean it up. And we need to make sure that it is cleaned up for all of the, the relevant exposure pathways and you want to stop those but then there's also some land, and something needs to happen to that land. And so you want to be thinking about those reuse decisions as part of the remediation process. This is an example that it's, it's cutting edge, it's new. They're just starting to think of these. So if you're thinking about areas to explore where the field is unoccupied, this is one of those. Um, the next statute of the Small Business Liability Relief and Brownfield Reauthorization Act is somewhat similar in the sense that it's, it's dealing with um, properties that are, are maybe moderately to perhaps not even contaminated, but there's a perception of contamination. About 30% of the brownfield sites don't even have contamination. And again, I'm going to be exploring this a little bit more detail in an example, but it's the notion that you've got contaminated sites that are usually in low-income communities of color that are, that are negative, but if you apply to the most uh, robust extent possible, the programs that EPA provides for cleanup and for, you know, dealing with the contamination, you can flip, flip those into something that's good for the community. And it's fundamentally about local land use planning, and it's, it's about a lot of really, ex it, it 
applies to green infrastructure, opportunities to do things on these properties that are going to be protecting other environmental resources. So that's an important statute. Um, the Emergency Planning Community Right to Know Act was actually a result of the uh, Bhopal, India incident uh, a couple of decades ago. And again, I read in the news this weekend that the president of Dow at the time of Bhopal just passed kind of unknowingly in a nursing home in Florida, but where thousands of people were con who were killed around a, a facility. And to a large extent, it's about getting information on what is being released from that facility. Again, in southern, just south of LA just last week, there was a refinery explosion. And fortunately, I don't think too many people were killed, but I did see on the, on the news a reference that, well, one of the reasons why our gas prices are going up today is because of the, 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 the explosions and the accidents of the refinery. So, you know, we're affected one way or the other downstream. But this is a statute that is designed to give information and also impose some planning requirements so that the people who live around these facilities are protected. Um, you have the Toxic Substance Control Act, uh, where I think that the two main provisions are dealing with lead and with asbestos, whether it's an indoor lead or whether it's, it's a disposal of those properties. And it's, it's probably one of the lesser used statutes, but it's nevertheless in, important. And the last statute, uh, the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Herbicide Act, uh, is, uh, is dealing with, obviously, with, with pesticides. And that's where I think things that are happening in, in the state of California uh, typify having some of the most serious issues, but I think some of the more creative and progressive work being done with issues such as RIF and things like that. Um, so like I said, when you think about environmental justice, look at the executive order, look at the presidential memorandum, but most certainly look at all of the environmental laws because they give you the authority and the framework to have conversations, to have discussions on how you can do the best uh, problem solving that's going to make sure that everyone's protected, especially the, the communities that are most exposed and, and overburdened. I want to spend um, just a little bit of time because, like I said, what I want to try to do here, you know, coming from the other center of the universe, is let you know what, what's happening in D.C. now that's going to be carrying over no matter who's president, no matter into the future. And one of the areas where we really have made a lot of progress um, to a certain extent is in the area of rulemaking. Obviously, Congress sets the laws, but they're more general in nature, and EPA is responsible for coming in and developing the more intensive roadmap on how, how you, you address those. And um, this, this is an example of the, the good news and the bad news of government being the same, which is it's slow. But uh, back in 2010, uh, and then it was started, and then it was, it was finalized as a draft in 2013, was what we call our uh, technical guidance for addressing environmental justice and regulatory analysis. And essentially, this is a, a procedural um, mechanism to make sure that as early on in the process, the people who are writing the rules, again, recognize that a rule that simply reduces pollution but does not consider certain subpopulations may not be as protective as it should be. And it goes again to the notion of a rising tide will lift all boats, but that's assuming you have a boat. So this, this particular document is going to be finalized in the next month or two. Um, but it's new, it's cutting edge, it's just out there. It's trying to get that process started and beginning. This is something to become familiar with. Um, but in addition to understanding the process of rulemaking, we are also developing a technical guide on how do you do that environmental justice analysis and how do you factor in um, existing conditions? How do you develop a baseline? How do you deal with the reference population? is being addressed through the subsequent document. Uh, it's, it's still not out yet. The Scientific Advisory Board is still reviewing it. But these are fertile areas of opportunity, fertile areas of activity. And as soon as they're finalized, again, you can become the experts because no one is an expert yet. So pay attention to that. Um, as I mentioned before, you know, you start with the law from Congress. You go to the rulemaking process from the agency. The permitting process and the permit is essentially the rule, the, the law, the authority for particular facilities. And EPA has done a lot of work, again, in this arena with the primary focus recognizing that the people who are affected, the people who live near the facility, should have the ability to participate in that decision-making process. They need to be informed of what's happening. They need to be informed of the options and the methods and the opportunities to, to eliminate and mitigate against any particular exposures. Um, EPA started by developing uh, regional implementation plans for the community engagement. Um, 
for those of you that may not know, and I don't see why you would know, but uh, EPA is broken down into 10 different regions. You're in Region 9 now, which is uh, California, um, Hawaii, I think Arizona. But so you can find those plans for this region, but no matter where you go across the country or where you want to practice, you'll find those as well. <coughs> um, but beyond giving people a seat at the table, you have to do more because you don't want people to come and be able to express a position, uh, but then have that not acted upon. EPA um, is developing some practices for starting off with EJ, uh, EPA issued permits uh, and not those that are issued by states. And so that was the second wave. And then the third wave actually is what we're working on right now is with um, developing an environmental justice analysis through the permitting process. So again, this is an area of, of really important um, uh, practice. Um, I want to pause and give you an example because I think this goes back to the concept and the emerging concept and the recognition of citizen science. Um, when I was practicing law in the state of Florida, uh, we had a situation where there was uh, a pulp and paper plant that wanted to come in and discharge into a river. And the permit was issued by EPA and the state based on the national data source. Um, but we were working with the low-income communities, and there was a, uh, a gentleman who was probably in his 80s, maybe had a third degree education, um, but he knew that the national data was inaccurate because a beaver dam had been built on that stream. And on the basis of his information, his testimony about that beaver, beaver dam, which, which affected the flow and the volume in that river, which affected the amount of pollution which could be discharged, that permit was denied. And so think of that image when you think about um, working with community members who are the best lay experts who probably know more about what's happening in their community than, than government regulators who are states or, or countries away. Um, the third area, again, this is the bread and butter of what EPA is doing in terms of in, uh, compliance and enforcement. And what's exciting about our compliance and enforcement work um, from one perspective is the fact that it's probably the most measurable uh, efforts that we've been able to undertake. Um, again, the goal specifically focused on environmental justice is to, to look at the impact of the enforcement actions on the, these most vulnerable populations. But uh, the, 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 the bullet points here are really the roadmap for understanding com uh, compliance and enforcement. And again, to those of you that may represent and may, may work with companies that may be subject to some of these statutes, it's important to understand this roadmap because that can help predict where things are going. But every uh, couple of years, we do select and implement national enforcement initiatives. Um, generally, they're going to follow air, you know, air, land, and water. We've got air toxics. You've got some, some programs uh, dealing with combined animal feeding lots. I know in the Central Valley, that's a big concern. Um, a big issue is energy extraction, whether it's hydraulic fracturing, uh, whether it's, it's uranium mining, lot, a lot of activities in that arena. So we've done that. Um, th again, there was a recognition that we do need to pay attention to the demographics of the population who is involved and affected by a particular facility. Um, there are a number of regional geographic initiatives. Um, also, what's exciting is in the area of enforcement remedies are some opportunities to develop some projects they may, that may allow the money to stay in the community and not go back to the federal treasury. Um, some numbers are pretty, I think they're pretty impressive. Um, we've been able to eliminate, you know, 515 million pounds of uh, uh, pollution uh, emitted to the air, 711 million pounds hazardously uh, materials that are reduced, so on and so forth. But this is, again, as an area where we've got some really good measurable baseline metrics that are, that are showing uh, that we are making a difference, which is really important. Um, the, the last point, like I said, from the, the, the Plan EJ is the concept of administration-wide action. And the executive order also um, established a federal interagency working group on environmental justice, which is at the time was 17 agencies and White House offices. Now it's over 20. Uh, but this, this, this um, entity was reconvened at the cabinet level uh, in 2010, and it, it will be in 2015, which is showing and it, I think is evidence of the importance of the concept of environmental justice across the federal family. And we have... Um, four different focal areas, again, one being NEPA, one being Title VI, uh, one climate change, and one what we call goods movement. But again, this is, this is a spotlight on the types of issues that are relevant 
to the federal family, which have their, their, their cascading effect into the, into the state levels. And under the issue of goods movement, I think what's happening in California with the Port of LA and Port of Long Beach, again, some of the most serious sources of pollution, but some innovative practices to try to, to deal with those. So uh, what I wanted to do next is really uh, go into a little bit more detail um, about some illustrations. And the one pause that I wanted to do is I wanted to have Cesar Campus stand up and wave his hand because I can sit here and talk about environmental justice. He's doing it here in the Central Valley. He's been part of our conversation this morning. And we'll, 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 you'll have the ability to talk about some of the experiences he's had. But what I want to do really quickly before we do that, and so we can have time for, uh, for conversation, is to give you an example of a statutory-based practice of environmental justice. And then I'll also have another one, which is a place-based. Um, but, but going back to NEPA, and again, its historic relationship, the presidential memorandum actually called out NEPA and said it is one of the most important statutes for addressing environmental justice. And again, for those of you that haven't had the wonderful class that's offered by Ben or the workshop on NEPA, it's a wonderful tool which brings together the different parties, the proponents of a project, those who may not want it, and everybody in between. But think about how do you analyze the impacts, especially as they relate to communities that are low income, minority, or indigenous? How do you think about alternatives which will impose the least um, harm to the community? And then if there is something that hasn't been addressed by alternatives, how do you mitigate it? So it's a very important statute um, that I think is going to be um, obviously of growing and growing importance over time. Um, if you look at the statute, some of the concerns and the terms uh, are very similar to what, uh, when you think about EJ, again, from terms, cumulative impact is actually defined in the statute. It talks about human environment. It's got community engagement. And again, the key pieces of, of analysis and mitigation. Um, I'd like to use this slide to emphasize that even though NEPA was written 25 years before the executive order, they got it. They talked about the need for all Americans to have healthy and safe environments. They talk about the recognition of cultural diversity and heritage. And again, that's something that tracks the executive order. Um, again, the methodology of NEPA, which is an environmental impact statement, is, has its parallel, has its crosswalk over to the executive order uh, where you analyze the effects of the environment, um, which look not, not just the environment, but the human health environment related to that activity. And again, this is such a fertile area for practice um, of your skills as you go out into, into the, the world to work. Um, again, once again, the, the concept of community engagement is vital, uh, the recognition that you will have better decisions made if you bring in all of the affected parties at the front end. And, it, and it's a great opportunity to make the conversation uh, with a level playing field of ground rules and understanding of terms. Um, I mentioned that we have uh, 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 there's a NEPA committee of the IWG, and I co-chair that. Um, and what's been exciting about this is that, that our, our, our motto is serving justice while saving money. And it's where we're trying to, to develop an environmental justice analysis that will help improve the effective, efficient, and cons consistent consideration of environmental justice in the NEPA process. And it's where we're bringing together uh, 20 different agencies and departments to really talk about how we can do this better and more effectively. And what we're doing is coming up with that framework, but it's going to be up to you to start taking the frameworks that we develop and finding the data sources, finding the analyses that are going to make those better decisions. So we can consider this to be a, a Brin Student Body Employment Act, if you want to think of it that way. Um, again, we're, our efforts here, and, and again, it's thinking of collaboration, it's thinking about anticipating problems and working backwards, but this effort here is really designed to benefit the government agencies who are spending a lot of money. You know, for example, the Keystone Environmental Impact Statement costs $3 million, and some of our agency uh, operating budgets are not quite that. So there's a lot of money behind uh, environmental impact statements, um, but it's developing a, a, a coordinated process and a coordinated practice that's really going to get us the best decisions possible, especially for those that are most affected. Um, one example, and again, just to flag, I can do it real briefly, um, as, as we know, when you think about climate mitigation, climate adaptation, you think about mitigation uh, uh, and infrastructure, um, it's a, a huge area of practice, whether it relates to highways, whether it's related to wastewater facilities, railroads, and so on and so forth. And there, there's a couple of interagency activities and, and commissions that are looking at that. 
This one was uh, ordained by Executive Order 13604 with another presidential memorandum, but that's something to pay attention to because it's a big uh, practice opportunity. I think it's something that will really help, help promote that intersection of environmental justice and better decision making. Here in California, I mentioned you've got some of the best and some of the worst. Um, some exciting work that's being done in LA that still is a, a work in progress <laughs> is dealing with the ports of LA and Long Beach, uh, where you know it's the entry point for 40% of the inputs into the United States. 20% um, of the diesel particulates in Southern California are coming from the port. There's 50 cities, a million residents, 70% of which are low-income minority. You know, they're living with all of this pollution. <coughs> and through the NEPA process, um, with a lot of the commenting and working with the state agencies, we're able to, to embed the concept of, of some expansions that would have zero-emit freight corridors. And, Technologies, and this is really cutting edge. This is where we're no longer debating how much pollution is um, is acceptable. We really want to get it to zero. Another example of NEPA in California, um, down in Riverside County, was where through the commenting process they actually took away a planned uh, roadway program to in order to keep the area natu uh, natural. So this is an example, and I'm actually running out of time. That's why I'm speeding up. Um, so, so again, think of NEPA, think of it as a statute that if you, if you own it, if you know how it works, not just how it's worked in the past, but where it's going, it's where you can be at the front end and the cutting edge uh, perspective on how decisions are made regarding the environment. The, um, <coughs> the second example that I wanted to leave you with is not statutory based, but it's really driven by the community and the reality of what they're facing. Remember the disproportionate impact factors? And back in the 90s when the concept of brownfield redevelopment was just coming into its own, it was at the same time that environmental justice was. And in Florida, <coughs> I was working with a number of communities, and so I would talk to them, I'd say, well, well what do you want out of these new authorities and these new initiatives? And uh, this woman, uh, who was a dear friend of mine, uh, Willa Clark, she said, well, I want my friends to stop dying at the bus stop. And I'm thinking, well, is it drive-by shooting? Is it drunken driving? No, people in their community had to get on a bus when they were having a heart attack or having a stroke. So this is where we really started this concept of taking the brownfields, getting them remediated, and flipping them into something good. And this particular concept has really grown and emerged to where right now we're, we're working in, in southern uh, New England and Connecticut where we're trying to increase mental health care access to communities on mental health hubs in the neighborhoods. We're doing workforce development. We're able to get um, $3.8 million to $8 million of Sandy recovery money to help support this. It's new money into an area. Um, we're working in southern Appalachia where we're tying together the concept of contaminated sites, abandoned gas stations, and looking them into to the, the, the local food initiative and how, how do you uh, connect people's access to, to food, healthy foods and health care and so on and so forth. And here in Region 9 in California, in Southern California, we're just starting a project where we're trying to bring together all the different entities um, who are concerned about these complicated, complex problems. And what this map represents is the blue is where you know, the Cal uh, screening me me methodology has identified uh, low-income communities of color. Um, the yellow dots represent the abandoned gas stations, which are causing pollution, but which can be remediated through EPA resources and turned into something useful. And then we've done an over overview of the map, identifying the areas where uh, people are, don't have access to health care facilities. And these are people who have exposure to, and they have high rates of asthma, but they don't have health care facilities. So we're starting this process in Southern California, and just last night I got an email where we're trying to integrate this particular effort of taking brownfields to health fields with the LA Urban Waters Program, which is a 17-member agency trying to pull together resources. And as my time is running down, the pitch here is, as we know, every story uh, is, is it's better when you can end your story with people wanting more, but this story is incomplete. And it's even better when you can have the people who are listening becoming part of that story to make sure it works. And what we're doing in Southern California, we want to do in Fresno. But again, this is cutting edge, it's new, it's bringing together diverse parties, bringing together environmental contamination, uh, access to services, and so on and so forth. So it's an exciting opportunity that um, we would love to have any of you help us with. And then finally, to, to land this plane, 
I like to leave you with this circle, which I like to call the Wheel of Fortune, um, because we think with environmental justice, because of the complexity and intensity of the problem, we want to make it as easy as possible. And we were able to put together this diagram, which is web-based, which covers the four corners of what people want of healthy, sustainable, equitable communities. You have to have good housing, you have to have a safe environment, you have to have access to, to get to places that you need to get to, and you need to have your health. And within those four corners, it's important to know where, where is the cutting edge research. We have on this link about 50 different uh, links on methodologies to assess hazards in the community and also to assess assets. Um, you want to contact a federal agency, just don't call up Department of Transportation or Department of Homeland Security. We break it down by the programs and by the people. And even though people change, you've still got a sense of that. Um, we have actual training materials, um, PowerPoint presentations, which dive deep on particular topics. And we also have information on uh, grant and funding opportunities. Well, the minute anything is done, it's obsolete, but at least if you know what's being funded today or what was funded yesterday, that gives you the ability to kind of, kind of get a sense of where, not just where the money could be coming from in the future, but also how you can get involved in the policy and in the practice to help shape where those, uh, where those dollars go. So, like I said, in conclusion, the concept of environmental justice is very broad. It touches everyone wherever we are. The challenges are so great that nobody has a luxury not to pay attention, not to do something in this, in this practice. And I know that when you leave the school with your degrees, you, with a degree from Bryn, you're going to be very, very well suited, not just to participate, but to really shape the future. So I look forward to working with any of you and all of you as you want to practice environmental justice. So thank you. so much. Um, I think we have a few minutes for questions, but I also want to put a plug in if folks are interested in continuing this conversation. Susie will be available for outside discussion in the Dean's Conference Room right upstairs from 2.30 to 3.30 today. So please feel free to stop by. All right, who's got some questions? All right, thank you. Um, I'm curious how you uh, consider uh, an equitable process and an equitable outcome That's in, in the environmental justice framework. It's interesting with the use of the words equity and equitable, and depending on who you're talking to at one point in time, you know, what is the appropriate term, but I think the translation to a scientific perspective is in that whole concept distribution. And it's relative versus absolute. And at the end of the day, from an equitable perspective, one could argue that equal pollution is equitable. And when we were start first doing environmental justice back in you know, the, the last millennium, maybe you guys weren't even born then, like in the 80s or 90s, is it, it wasn't about equal pollution. It was about understanding you know, who is getting the burden, who's getting the benefit. And, and again, from a very, uh, I think, a very methodological, quantifiable perspective, I refer you back to the chapter 10 of the economic guidelines because it really does talk about the difficulties and challenges of doing an analysis, whether it's from a, an economic perspective, which is what cost-benefit analysis is, but it's, it's, it's quantifying some of these other factors. And so I think that, that I think that for me the, the, the walk away for you because you all are so young and you've got so much to work with is to not be locked into one term but look at the outcome that we're working toward. And, and again, in, in certain arenas it is equitable, um, whether it's economic analysis but also in equitable development. But it's, but it's moving toward that decision that, that's fair and that is, is, is comprehensive. Hi, um, so I know that in California, <clears throat> there's often tension between environmental groups and environmental justice groups. Like for example, um, if you want to build a new plant, but you don't want to build it in the poor community because it'll have negative effects on that community. So instead you're like, let's dredge a wetland. And then the environmental groups are like, no, don't do that. Um, so since you guys are now both encompassing both the environmental perspective as well as the environmental justice perspective. How do you resolve that tension within the EPA? 
And that, that's an excellent question, and we confronted a lot again in my past life where I would be in a position to be, you know, working for environmental protection standards, but some of the, the land preservation uh, organizations would be willing to accept a lesser protective standard because they'd get more money for land preservation. And that was kind of what was happening in the 90s. And I think that um, what's happening today, you can start with some basic principles of environmental justice, which is that community, that, that engagement at the front end, the meaningful engagement, letting people who are affected by these potential facilities be part of that discussion. So I think that's the hallmark of that. I think that where, where we're getting to in terms of the next phase is the work that we're doing to prevent the pollution. And it's the notion of um, you know, green infrastructure and, and, and the zero, uh, the zero uh, emissions kind of technology. Um, but I think it's an excellent point. I think it's always there. The key is to have the people who are adversely affected at the table so that they can make sure their interests are represented. And then, again, coming back to the, the new generation coming up with those technologies, which, you know, maybe we don't need to have that facility at all, or maybe we can reduce its impact through some, some zero emission technologies. Great. Thank you so much. I think we have hit our time, so out of respect for everyone else's time. Um, I'll end this, but please do come by uh, the Dean's Conference Room at 2.30 if you want to continue this conversation. Thanks so much, Susie. Sure. Thank you. Thank you.